The Hutt Valley Campaign was a series of disputes between Maori and British in the Lower North Island from 1840 to 1850. The battle was fought over land and sovereignty. It was triggered by numerous factors including careless land purchasing practices of the New Zealand Company, armed government support for settler land claims, and confusion over land ownership from both cultures. The campaign saw fights at Bullcott's Farm and Battle Hill. Home of the first organised settlement by the New Zealand Company out of England, the Hutt Valley grew as an important centre for the nation. The campaign was a mark of reassurance for the settlers and that their needs were being met by the Crown. Conflict in two key areas was resolved and the Hutt Valley was in the middle of New Zealand's development, a settlement to which would see a vast change, culturally and economically. The New Zealand Company from Britain saw potential in the settlement of Wellington. The mix of country and townland, as depicted in the sketch on offer, appealed to the company. As Wellington lacked sufficient parts of land for this vision, the company turned their focus to the Hutt Valley. Although this solution was troublesome, with Māori already having rights to occupy the land. Paths like the one shown here at Te Aro were spread throughout the Hutt Valley. With the assistance of Māori-speaking whaler and trader Richard Barrett, William Wakefield, the principal agent for the New Zealand Company, in November 1839 began negotiating over the purchase of Māori land with Māori chiefs on the Batoni foreshore. Bad land purchasing practices by the European New Zealand Company saw conflict arise between the two cultures. Maori naivety was often taken advantage of, and unaware they were giving up their continued use of lands would sell off large pieces of land through trade of goods not worthy of the amount of land they were trading. Investors in the company were promised 100 acres of farmland and one town acre. Promises made by the company were made by doubtful and sometimes inadequate land purchases from the Maori. Confusion over the validity of land purchases were, was a reoccurring theme. Accounts of this have been in Nelson, Wanganui and Taranaki. All over the, the country, the New Zealand Company was trying to obtain land not always fairly by taking advantage of Maori innocence to benefit. This was the result of the language barrier and the different ideas behind land ownership from the two cultures. Richard Barrett, who had lived in New Zealand 10 years previous to the arrival of Wakefield, was the official translator of the Maori land purchases. Barrett, alongside representatives of the New Zealand Company, spent 10 days at Port Nicholson negotiating purchase of land. He secured the signatures of 16 Maori for the purchase of an estimated 64,000 hectares of Maori land. Barrett has been later described as having marked incompetence as an interpreter, who was unable to translate the deed into Maori and quite an inadequate of conveying its meaning to the Maori. European settlers believed the validity of land purchases was in the form of signed documents and trade. Maori ideas behind land ownership was due to numerous reasons including inherited rights from other Maori, rights obtained by conquest, and the rights of occupation and use. Maori had much more complex concepts behind land ownership than the British. The idea of absolute ownership of land was not considered to be a thing to the Maori. Whānau and hapu could have different rights to the same piece of land. One group of Maori may have had the right to catch birds in a selection of trees, another to fish in the water nearby, and yet another to grow crops on the surrounding land. Boundaries for a particular tribe were rare, and rights to certain parts of the land were under constant negotiation. The difference in ideas by the two cultures caused confusion over land ownership in the Hutt Valley. Contrasting conclusions were taken away from meetings over land purchase. Murray were often unaware to the fact that they had, under British understanding, signed away their treasured land. This caused confusion, anger and failure to acknowledge the validity of transfers by the Maori. A man by the name of William Spain, an attorney from Hampshire in England, was ordered to investigate the validity of the 1839 land purchases by the New Zealand Company. He began his investigation in Wellington in May in 1842. Upon this, he discovered the majority of the New Zealand Company's purchases did not hold up. Although finding the New Zealand Company guilty of invalid land sales, he did not declare this, and supported by Governor Fitzroy, 
worked with the New Zealand company to find a compensation which would fix these transactions between the two cultures. Spain saw the compensation as adequate, as Maori liked the idea of settlement because of the economic advantages. He believed that settlers deserved justice also, as they believed they were buying land fairly. This was either accepted reluctantly or declined by Maori. These promises of compensation resolved nothing. Te Rapraha and Te Rangahaiata were paid £400 by the company, but Ngāti Tama and Ngāti Rangatahi received neither land or money, all of whom had been previous owners of Wellington land. Spain's efforts to try and compensate for both cultures was not well investigated nor well compensated. His willingness to work with the New Zealand company to find compensation for both cultures shows his unprofessionalism. His actions did not please either culture. Settlers were occupying land to which Maori believed was theirs, and Maori were occupying land to which settlers believed were theirs. Maori were given unrealistic solutions to compensate for their loss of land. When Governor Fitzroy was needed back in Britain, Governor George Grey, shown here, was appointed. He realised that Spain's investigation was no use and had changed nothing. Although implying that he was not here to fight, but to sort out William Spain's allegations and promises, upon his arrival, Governor Gray brought soldiers and two Navy vessels alongside him. Gray met with Takaya, a Maori chief, who promised to remove his people from the land once he had been compensated for the 300 acres of potatoes that he had growing on the land. Governor Gray disagreed to this and stated that no acts of compensation would be carried out until Ngāti Tōa had left. When Ngāti Tōa finally left at the end of February in 1846, settlers moved in almost straight away, destroying the Maori village chapel and the Maori cemetery. When Ngāti Rangatahi and Ngāti Tama heard of these actions, they returned to the land almost immediately and attacked the settlers' property. It was this series of events which caused Governor Grace to declare martial law on the 3rd of March in 1846. Through these actions shown by Gray and his followers, Maori knew that he was not a sacred man and could not be trusted. Te Rangi Hayata stressed the fact that he had no desire to fight. This is not the first incident that Governor Gray's judgments have been seen as untrustworthy. With his letters of victory to his bosses about how the British campaign of the Northern War had been so successful. Further research has been undertaken on these events. The Hutt Valley Tribunal found that the validity of the purchase of 64,000 hectares of land through gaining the signature of 16 Maori was inadequate. Along with Richard Barrett speaking Little Maori, half of the 16 signatures on the deed were signed by members of the Pito Wampa. Several important chiefs, including those of Te Aro, Pipitea, and Kumutoto Pa, took little part in the proceedings. The chief of the Kumutoto Pa, Natata is shown here. A Maori missionary who had been invited to the signing had refused to sanction it. Barrett also expressed his doubts towards the transaction with the worry towards owners who had not been consulted. The company saw these owners as slave tribes who need not to be considered. Despite all of this, William Wakefield expressed the validity of the purchase of the whole Port Nicholson area with the support of all chiefs concerned. It makes you wonder why Maori would agree to sign such a deed in the first place. Reasons being the protection from other tribes and the con competition of land and resources. Having a Pākehā settlement nearby was desirable and helpful in protecting Maori against other tribes. Trade things like muskets was a source of protection from surrounding tribes. Weaponry was very useful as there were many Maori tribes in the area due to the dis displacement from the musket wars. The goods that Europeans brought was also good for mana. The process used by the British for Maori to agree to vacate their land was both questionable and disreputable. The British had the intention of obtaining Maori land and were willing to find cunning ways to trick Maori, with fear of incompetence if the correct process was taken. Land skirmishes between the Maori and the British had escalated. 
Although arm peace was no substitute for a true resolution, it was own, open knowledge that Maori had planned an attack on the Hutt Valley. Words of specific warning had been sent to Fort Richmond about the matter. This was chosen to not be taken seriously and British continued to reduce military numbers. Fort Richmond, along with the Hutt Bridge, is shown. This picture reveals that the development of the Hutt Valley was still in its early stages, with Hutt Valley land still being very much covered in forestry. Aggravated by the fact that they had been stripped of their land and that they were not being taken seriously by the British, some 200 Ngāti Tōa under Upper Wanganui chief Tōpini Te Mamaku crawled up the Hutt River bank near Bulcott's farm. Held by around 45 men of the 58th under Lieutenant G. H. Page. The painting shows a British fortification made of wood. British forces were not worried about Maori weaponry and knew that a simple wooden fence could withstand any force applied from distance but from a distance by Maori, with the biggest threat being musket fire. Almost making a mockery of Maori warriors and battle resources that they possessed. While sneaking towards the farm, a tour was spotted by a soldier, William Allen, who was on watch on the outlying picket. Having no time to react and warn the others, Allen was struck down by a pataitai, losing nearly his whole arm. Lying on the ground, he tried to use his other hand to blow the trumpet to send warning. Te Mamakul's men moved in for the kill, annihilating four men at the picket and taking to Allen's arm as a trophy. This was an attempt to surprise and overwhelm the men stationed at Bilcott's farm, but Te Mamaku underestimated the regiments. Upon entering the farm, alert had been sent out about the presence of the tour. Remaining troops retired to a barn, which had been enclosed in stockade timbers and loopholed for defence. Despite being outnumbered four to one, British discipline never wavered. They had anticipated this attack. During the battle, a small party of British military arrived. It was at this point when the Maori retreated across the river, performed haka, and retired. The battle lasted for about an hour and a half, with British casualties being six dead and four wounded. Mamaku's losses were not known, although thought to have at least ten wounded and a number dead. The battle at Bulcott's farm was not a large battle even by New Zealand standards. However, the battle threw an electric mood through the community. Settlers saw arms for protection. The attack on Bulcott's farm did not solve anything, despite the loss of a few lives from both cultures. Maori had obtained no land from the fight, and European settlers were now more impassioned than ever. The attack on Bulcott's farm, in my opinion, was an account of the dominance that Britain asserted over Maori. The willingness to fight against Maori being almost outnumbered 4 to 1, shows the resilience of the British and the adversity they were willing to go through to achieve their goal of a British settlement in the Hutt Valley. Exhausted of disruptions in the settlement of the Hutt Valley, Governor Gray set out for Wellington. Governor Gray travelled past Sir Rapraha's Taupo Pa to give the old serpent the impression he was returning to Wellington. Gray returned during the night and at daybreak sent 200 men to seize Sir Rapraha. Te Rapraha was surprised as he slept. One man grabbed him by the neck. Te Rapraha screamed for help. Nati Tor, Nati Tor, whilst biting one of Gray's soldiers' arms. Even at four to one, his kidnappers were not able to make him fast until one of them grabbed his privates and held on. The tribe came running, but Pākehā were everywhere. Te Rapraha was overpowered. The capture of one of, the, of Maori's greatest leaders create a universal satisfaction between settlers. However, without evidence to prove conspiracy or treason, Governor, Governor Gray had no right to hold Terapraha prisoner. This was not respected, however, and Terapraha remained in slavery while Gray looked for evidence against his prisoner. Gray's motives behind arresting Terapraha was a way of taking authority and the hope of cutting off ties with Maori occupying land. Gray's capture of one of the most powerful chiefs in New Zealand and the manner of it created an immediate sensation. To the New Zealand company settlers, it was satisfaction, but for the Maori, it was a sense of de- degradation and an insult to their mana. Te Rapraha's decision to work alongside the Europeans had now prevailed.
and that Maori now saw it unwise to trust Governor Gray. Governor Gray's proneness to suspicion often caused him to do whatever he needed to get the, the sought-after outcome. His often obscure judgments were not always what was best for the Hutt Valley. His attitude of a British settlement at all cost caused a somewhat diversion between members of the cultures for years to come. After hearing news, Gray's focus turned to propose disposal of Te Rangi Hayata, another prestigious chief, with the objective of blockading his pa at Pa Hatanui. The pa was discovered empty. A few days later, Gray found Te Rangi Hayata's new position at what is now known as Battle Hill. The arrival of British reinforcements enabled an assault against Te Rangi Hayata's new position. The attack began on the 6th of August in 1846 in freezing rain. The assault force consisted of 250 British soldiers as well as military and police. They were joined by 150 Te Atiawa led by Wurumu. On the 7th of August, two small mortars were brought up to about a kilometre from the fortification. Approximately 80 shells were fired, many landing in or near Te Rangi Hayata's position. Reluctant to advance and fearful of a counter-attack, the British decided to withdraw their regular troops. From the 10th of August, it was left to Te, Aui, Te Ati Awa's warriors to launch an occasional raid. On the 13th, it was discovered that Te Rangi Hayata had slipped away under the cover of darkness and rain. Te Rangi Hayata had always said that no Pākehā would make a tie of him. Gray sent hundreds of soldiers after him, but Te Rangi Hayata fought his way to safety and found refuge among the Poro Utau swamps north of the Manawatu River. Although Te Rangi Hayata had not been overcome, Gray could safely leave Te Rangi, Ta- Te Rangi Hayata to his hideaway. Gray's actions reflect the dominance of the British. A place which was not so long ago full of Maori was now Pakia run with majority Maori evicted. Before 1846, the Pakia at Port Nicholson had been living, even if they did not quite know it, in a Maori world. After 1846, Maori were living in a Pakia one. The Hart Valley campaign was a mark of settler reassurance for the development of a European settlement. Settlers could now develop a land of possibilities into another England. This coincides with the ideas of the New Zealand Company as their aim was to promote the systematic colonisation of New Zealand. They intended to follow the colonising principles of Edward Gibbon Wakefield who proposed the creation of a new model England society in the Southern Hemisphere. With the removal of Ngāti Tōr from some of the Hutt Valley lands, there was now room for economic development. The Hutt Valley grew as a farming and horticultural district. Prior to the arrival of European settlers, the hut was covered in forestry, with only a selection of cleared land for growing things like potatoes and kumara. At the time of European arrival, swamp marshlands extended several kilometres up the valley from the river mouth. Wetland species such as rapo, flax and tautul dominated the landscape. Beyond this marshland, kahi, katea, matai, pukatea and rimu forests grew extensively on the valley floor, with tautara, tawa and beach on the hill slopes. Settlers were now clearing land at will to farm and for timber to sell and build houses. Domesticating or taming the wilderness was a way of emphasising to the Maori that they were here to stay, a mark of civilization. Townships arose at Batoni, Lower Hutt and Upper Hutt. All towns were fortified to ensure that any chance of a Maori attack was eliminated. This gave reassurance to settlers. The presence of large barriers between the two cultures would have separated them not only physically, but it forbid the ability to develop, to develop the Hutt Valley together as one. There was very much a sense of a British world and a Maori world, very different from each other. Roads were constructed to connect townships. A city of Maori landships and buildings was now a thing of the past, with the development of all things British. 
As years went by, Maori became more and more reluctant to sell their land. Through the experiences of the Hopewelly War, they knew that selling of, the selling of land without knowing exactly what it entailed was unwise. After the fighting in the hut in 1847, the position of the Maori in the region took a change for the worse. Not only did the Maori have to deal with the humiliation of defeat, they had lost many of their cultivation grounds. Down from the estimate of 150 acres of land in 1845 to only 55 acres of land. Maori still had the opportunity to grow and sell and produce and work for wages, but they had lost the control of the region. Soldiers were believed to no longer be needed in the hut belly as the government were not worried about another large scale attack and moved elsewhere to the likes of Australia and Auckland. This again reinforces the idea of British dominance and settlers' reassurance of safety due to the decrease of British military, and that fighting would be over for good, and that the Hutt Valley was a safe place to make a life for themselves. For time after the campaign, development of land was to follow, with the introduction of more townships, like that of Lower Hutt shown here, more settlers, and British fittings, landscaping the hut to what it is today. Progress was slow to begin with. After the conclusion of the war, it had gained the reputation of being a dangerous settlement, full of savages. Auckland's population rapidly increased as it did not have the same reputation. Many settlers had been scared off by the idea of establishing a lifestyle in the Hutt Valley because of the previous events that had taken place. Using Establisher Store and Rob Fillett's great criteria, I have been able to depict the significance of the Hutt Valley War. The Hutt Valley campaign was a vital event in Hutt Valley history. The confrontation between Maori and the British involved the transfer of goods through trade, transfer of land, and transfer of overall dominance between the two cultures. The campaign was the introduction of economic development of the Hutt Valley lands. By New Zealand standards, however, it was not as important it wouldn't have affected many people outside of the Hutt Valley region. The Northern War, although only a year earlier, is seen as a much more important event of New Zealand history, as this was the first serious challenge to the Crown in the years after the Treaty of Waitangi, and an event which marked the beginning of the wider Northern, North, North Island conflicts, also known as the New Zealand Wars, which the Hutt Valley Campaign was a part of. The Hutt Valley Campaign isn't really an event which is talked about as a key historical event of New Zealand history. This is very interesting considering the series of events that it entailed. It is a piece of evidence which shows the transfer of cultural authority in a place which not so long ago was very much a Maori settlement. Pākehā flocked to the Hutt Valley in the conclusion of the war, with the assurance of their safety. The Hutt Valley is a city which has been developed by majority Pākehā, due to the sh shift of land possession as a result of the Hutt Valley Campaign. The campaign stripped many Maori of their ancestral land and sent them to live elsewhere. There were accounts of tribes being forced away from their ancestral lands. Governor Gray had chased two prestigious chiefs of the Ngāti Tor tribe, Te Rangi Haiata, out of the area into the Poral Tau swamps north of the Manawatu River, and Te Rapraha, to Kapiti Island where he now resided. Both chiefs were followed by a vast majority of their followers to their new locations. As the force of Maori was decreasing, the force of the Europeans was very much increasing. Without the two prestigious chiefs, the authority of the Maori in the Hutt Valley was, was diminishing, and the possibility of a rebellion against the British to come into land. The Hutt Valley campaign slow. resulted in casualties from both the Maori and Europeans. It is fair to say that Maori suffered much more from the event, especially in the aftermath. For European settlers, they were afraid of their newly bought land being raided by savages and for their safety. For the Maori, it was much more complex, with warrior losing mana, ancestral lands, and the fear of extinction. The Hutt Valley Campaign is still affecting people today. Many people who live in or have relations to the Hutt Valley would not be there without the work of William Wakefield with the New Zealand Company and Governor Gray towards the European settlement. Ngāti Tor's land claims, which relate primarily to the loss of land, are still being addressed in hope of compensation of the Maori hardships which were undertaken as consequence of European artful and devious behaviour in the process of gaming land to colonise. The Crown was acknowledged 
The, the Crown has acknowledged and apologised to Ngāti Toa for breaches of the Treaty of Waitangi and its principles, and has addressed the problem by paying out millions of dollars for their breaches, causing grievances for Ngāti Toa, including recognition of Ngāti Toa's former domain, cultural restorations and purchase of property. Many believe that the processes used by the British over the path of the campaign were crude and unacceptable towards the native people of the land. The New Zealand Company knew exactly what they were doing in using obscure and vague practices to obtain easy land from the Maori. Although Gray's actions were mysterious, he did not fail in achieving the company's goal of colonising the Hutt Valley to be similar to that of England. In my opinion, despite the bad land purchasing practices used by the New Zealand Company to obtain their goal of settlement in the Hutt Valley, there is no question that their presence was a critical part in the development of the Hutt Valley as a settlement. The ways to which the New Zealand Company went about securing land is often criticised, and although I agree with the fact that some of their processes undertaken by the British took advantage of Maori naivety, I believe that if the correct procedures were taken to obtain settlement with proper signings and decent translation so that both cultures had mutual understanding of what was happening, the Hutt Valley may not be as developed as what it is today. No matter what the procedure, it would fail to meet the needs of and wants of both cultures. An aspect of trickery was needed by the British to give the hut and New Zealand what it needed to evolve as a modern society.